Garvis is clinical director of patientaccess.com. Morning, Sarah. Good morning. Let's talk about symptoms first of all then. Mm-hmm. What are the symptoms that should see us stay off work or keep kids, kids off school? Because if we all do that when we've got a September cold, the country's going to grind to a halt by next week. No, you're quite right. Now, a runny nose, sneezing, sore throat should not see you off work, should not see you self-isolating, unless they are accompanied by a new continuous cough, by which we mean coughing consistently for more than an hour or so. Uh, So not, you know, just, oh, I've got something in my throat and I'm choking and it's sort of irritating. But if it continues more than an hour or you get more than three bouts of coughing in 24 hours or a fever, or a change to or loss of your sense of smell or taste. Those three things, any of those, yes, they are potential symptoms of coronavirus, but just the sort of bit of a sniffle, bit of a sneeze, bit of a sore throat. Even a bit of a cough, really, because this is the trickiest one, isn't it? People have got a cough, but it isn't a dramatic, continuous, uh, completely out of nowhere cough like what you've just described. It might be tempting to, to stay off or to think that you should stay off, but perhaps that's not necessary. Well, I think if you've got a cough and you're persistent, you you keep coughing. I think all of us know what it's like when you've got a cold. You just get that tickle and it just keeps on coming back. A one-off tickle is one thing, but if it if it keeps going over the course of a day, then you do need to think about coronavirus. Right, because I'm I'm trying to think how this would play out in our family. It'd be a huge impact, wouldn't it, if if one of my children or me or my wife, if we you got a bit of a cough and we thought it's more than a bit of a cough, it's a cough, maybe that's a yeah. symptom. Maybe we have to make the decision to self isolate here. That's going to be, um, you know, an end to work, an end to school, an end to all sorts of plans for the next two weeks for all of us. So it's a big call, isn't well, it? Well, it, it is if we can't get testing, and this is where testing is so absolutely crucial. But I think there are a couple of points here. The first is we have seen a lot of people test the whole family when one of them gets symptoms. In fact, interestingly, and I think there's so much confusion around this, I actually saw an article on the BBC website just yesterday about how do you get testing for a family of eight? Well, I'm not convinced that an entire family of eight have, I I don't think in my my entire time as a GP, I've ever seen an entire family of eight all down with the same symptoms at the same time. So I think that's really important. If one person in the family has symptoms, they should be getting tested. But the rest of the family should not, absolutely not be getting tested if they haven't got symptoms. That's interesting. So we should isolate but not get a test. Exactly. Exactly. And I think this is where a lot of the confusion has arisen. I was actually really cross when I heard Matt Hancock say people are abusing the system. People don't go and get a test because they fancy it. They don't go and get a test because they enjoy the idea of having a swab. Well, he was suggesting they were getting a test because it was free, like it was some kind of entertainment. Exactly. So I think what's happening is people are doing it for all the right reasons, but they don't recognise. Interestingly, my poor husband said to me yesterday, well, I'm not sure the only reason I realised that that's what you were supposed to do because I live with you. I'm not sure I was really certain what we should be doing. So basically... If you have symptoms, you need a test because you could be positive. If you develop symptoms today, then the people that you are closest to, so the people you live with and people you've been in close contact with, could potentially have been exposed by you to the virus for the last 48 hours because you can be infectious for up to two days before you get symptoms. But virtually nobody develop symptoms within two days. Nobody becomes infectious within two days. The average time to develop symptoms is about five days and people can get symptoms up to 12 days after they're exposed. So the people you're in contact with are not going to be positive now. Certainly not going to be positive the day they came into contact with you. So there's no point getting a test for them and that's you know putting a lot of demand on the system. What about this? I'm starting to hear that bosses in workplaces and head teachers of schools are saying, once you've gone off with symptoms, you can't come back until you've had a negative test, even if you've been isolating for two weeks. Now that's well, just that's nonsense, isn't it? No, that is a complete nonsense and that's not appropriate. What you have, if, if you, what we now say is once you've got symptoms symptoms, you isolate for 10 days. It used to be a week. But the point is that if you've had coronavirus, then 
you may continue to cough after you stop being infectious. Now, there is a small chance that people will continue to be infectious, but the vast majority of people are no longer infectious after 10 days, as long as, and this is very important, as long as they are feeling better, as long as the fever has gone and they're feeling better in themselves. But they can come back if they continue to cough as long as they've isolated for 10 days, and they can come back if they still have lost their sense of smell or taste. People's sense of smell or taste is going for months at a time. We cannot have whole swathes of the population locked down for four months because they've lost their sense of smell and taste. Finally, could we not have predicted that when everyone went back to school and everyone always gets coughs and colds every year, there might have been more demand on the testing system? Well, duh. <laughs> I was. I, mean, I, had, I had a call with the deputy chief medical medical officer about three weeks um, before schools go back, and I really, really pushed on this. And um, she said, "Oh, we're going to have to think about what we see." And I said, "Look, you know, I can tell you, as a GP, as duty doctor in the middle of, um, you know, in the middle of winter, um, it doesn't matter. Forget sore throats. Forget runny noses. I can have thirty parents of kids." every single one of whom has got fever and cough. And that's just one GP surgery. How many times is that replicated across the country? Sarah, thank you very much. Lovely to talk to you as ever. Dr Sarah Jarvis with the clearest advice you will hear anywhere. Andrew Sharp from Health Watch West Berkshire now. Morning, Andrew. Morning, Andrew. How are you? Yeah, great, thank you. We've been following the, the situation around here. We've seen that uh, at our own test centres in Newbury and Slough, the ability to get an appointment there has got less and less and less. It's now virtually impossible, even though the test centres are still there, they're fully staffed, and they're not usually doing very much uh, because of this problem with capacity in the laboratories turning the test results round. What impact is that having on people around here who need a test? Uh, I think it's making people anxious. Uh, I think it's starting to clog systems up, as you've said. We've had some calls into Health Watch about people who, uh, some of them are even key workers who can't get tests and are having to self-isolate. And, of course, that takes them out of wherever it is they're working. We've had uh, clinicians talking about having to cancel uh, potential clinics. So this is very, very, very serious. And then the other really key thing is we were just starting to get, you know, the hospitals working again uh, and the hospital testing system, it's really key, is separate to the national testing system. So you can, if you're going in for a scan or an operation or something, get a, a, a test done and turned around really quickly by the hospital uh, well, that's interesting because we're also hearing, to, to be fair, from other parts of the country rather than here, we're hearing about people who've got surgery booked, who have to have a COVID test before they can go and have their surgery. The COVID test doesn't come back in time. The surgery they desperately need and been waiting for for months is then cancelled. We don't want that happening. No, we don't want that happening. But equally, you know, we, we still need people to, to go for their appointment. And if they're given a test at the hospital, they should go for that and make every effort they can to get there because, uh, you know, the hospital's still running with a lot of do not attend. So there's two different things here. One is the national system, which, you know, ideally probably shouldn't be run by people who are sort of used to cleaning offices and changing light bulbs. But the um, system being run by hospitals be actually being run by you know, the hospitals themselves, and we do need people to, you know, go to their appointments and things like this. But the, the difficulty is this is so confusing to the population. Uh, you know, the, I, I, I remember not so long ago uh, ministers saying there's tests for everyone who wants one. No one's mentioned that. I remember that being on the news. So we've mm -hmm. gone from that a couple of months ago, admittedly when the cases were lower. So are, is anyone surprised that people are confused? Andrew, thank you. Andrew Sharp from Health Watch, West Berkshire.